I heard somewhere that um, a goldfish, when you see it swimming around in circles inside of its bowl, will for forget um, the starting point of any hypothetical circle that it's swimming in by the time that it's completed the circuit of the fishbowl. Um, now that fascinates me. Um, goldfish, I guess that would say that they're, by our standards, pretty stupid. Um, or there's something that they, some faculty that we have that they lack. Um, or we are burdened, perhaps, <laughs> with a faculty that they are free of. Um, <clears throat> I would say that a goldfish, then, let's assuming, of course, that this is correct about goldfish. I don't know how we'd check that, but anyway. Just as kind of a thought experiment, let's just say that it's true, that that's how a goldfish's existence is, how its mind works or whatever, how its reality is. Um, what would that do to that goldfish's sense of becoming? Uh, its sense of even its own identity or its existence? You know, the, you, you can really add on to this because a goldfish has its eyes on either side of its head and they look that way, presumably. So there's a fairly good chance that the goldfish has no idea what it looks like and it might not even have any feeling of being in a physical body because it's more or less floating. <laughs> um, in fact, I guess one could say since it's in water, it is floating. So gravity doesn't have the same effect as it has on us. Um, doesn't mean the same thing, and it can't do this and say, oh yeah, this is part of me, or there's no mirror for it to look into, because its eyes don't work like that. <laughs> um, now imagine a goldfish's experience, and it's, it's, um, its experience of becoming. Uh, it can't store anything beyond a few seconds in terms of its own memory. It can't um, remember things. It, I would assume that that would severely impact its reasoning uh, capacity simply because it uh, it couldn't actually um, it couldn't draw on things in the past to sort of make sense of the here and now um, but can you think of anything more placid than the sight of a goldfish swimming around in circles in its bowl <laughs> we look at that and we go that's hell that's Sisyphus maybe but does the goldfish see it that way who knows I don't know. Um, that makes me think uh, of becoming. Of The goldfish, I would say, is far more in a state of perpetual becoming than we are. Again, assuming we're reading the goldfish correctly. Assuming that's even possible. Um, what would that say, say, about the goldfish's identity? What would that say about the goldfish's um, capacity for reasoning, capacity for drawing on its past experiences to make sense of the present, a present that really doesn't really change all that much, but presumably in, in the wild, and there are plenty of wild goldfish, I, um, I've seen them all the time in the Philippines, I guess that's where most of the world's tropical fish come from, a little bit of trivia there, um, what must it be like when the darn thing is in the wild? Um, it nothing seems to would leave an imprint on it and it's just there <laughs> it's just perpetual experience it's just perpetually new things happening to it um, you know they, they, you push the metaphor a bit more and you just sort of say imagine a human being who has completely lost not only his memory but his capacity to store any new memory at all but he's still alive and he's still conscious what must that be like I would say that's the monster. That's um, You're not making sense of the present or the future by looking back into the past, as I say with my metaphor of the moving car um, going up the street. You're looking back in the normal scheme of things. You're looking back out the rear window of a car as the world whizzes by like this. Now, the goldfish, I would posit the view that the goldfish would um, be more likely to be seeing reality the way that I suggest might horrify a human being, where you turn around and you look over the driver's shoulder and into the uh, through the windshield at what's coming. You're not looking at what happened anymore. You're not looking at what, what took place in the past anymore, because there is no past. 
the past doesn't make sense in your in your universal view, your epistemology. The past has no reality to you because it, there's nothing. It's not being stored anywhere. No memory. Um, perpetual, chaotic becoming. Uh, chaotic because you can't you can't draw upon any of your past experiences to make sense out of it. They aren't there anymore. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> um, what would that be like? <laughs> to stare that monster in the face. Um, I would assume, again, back to my old friend existential panic, I would presume that that's, that's a good, a good, um, that's a good illustration, I think, of some, for someone who's never actually experienced existential panic. It's, it's a good experience. It's a good example of, of that, a good illustration of it. No memory of anything at all from one second to the next, and your entire memory of the past is abolished, but you're, you're still conscious. This is just a thought experiment. As I say, I, I don't even know if such a thing is possible. But it's an interesting way of looking at the passage of time, or um, Heraclitus' Pantahrae. Um, and it's an, also, it's, it's an interesting illustration of how identity is created in here. Because we're looking at a universe that makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> and in the goldfish's world, sense is not a requirement. But in our world, sense is a requirement. We need anchors. We need a place to stand. We need somewhere to sort of say, this is where my reasoning begins. We need axioms. We need something to grab onto here to sort of say, okay, we're in this mad torrent of endless becoming, but we need somewhere to stand to deal with the fact that we're here. Beware of pursuing this if this idea freaks you out because it is disturbing. Um, it's, you know, I would say that it's probably the closest thing that we can come to recreating the birth experience in our own minds. A baby presumably is a blank slate and suddenly bang all these things are happening that it has absolutely no way of understanding or coming to terms with um, at the at the beginning at least because this it a baby has no past the second it comes out of the womb all these bizarre things are happening that are absolutely unaccountable um, they make no sense at all um, primal horror, I would presume, but who knows, because the, the baby may, may not even have any requirement for sense. They're just like, hey, what is all this? I don't know. Oh, weird. You know, that kind of thing. Um, goldfish style. <laughs> um, endless becoming uh, with no past. And if you have no past, you have no future. You've only got the eternal present. You're at that fulcrum between the present and the past. Um, what what would that be like? And what does that, again, do to identity, to form, uh, if the universe is eternally in flux? Um, it kind of abolishes the idea of being, but it doesn't, because there's still the fixed point. There's your fixed point. <laughs> um, that's not solipsism, if you ask me. Because becoming is still taking place. <laughs> the outside world is still happening. It has no fixed point. You can't make any sense out of it, but that doesn't matter. It's still there. Just because I can't make any sense out of something doesn't mean that nothing is happening. Um, the goldfish might not have the slightest clue what is happening, but I think that it grasps that something is happening <laughs> uh, because it perceives. Um... The interesting thing is, again, I'm I'm into tantra, um, and I say tantra, and the only the only thing that I do in tantra is a form of meditation and yoga, <laughs> um, and it's just you 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 think about this, you think about this a lot, this becoming thing, or this is this is tantric type of meditation. This is what you fix your mind upon. This idea of the illusory nature of all forms and the illusory nature of perhaps your own identity. Um, 
at least your own identity the way that you've understood it before. <laughs> Try and imagine yourself as that goldfish. Can't see its own body. Can't remember anything. <laughs> um, some people say, no, no, we don't want to be that way. That's, that's the primal scream. And that's, of course, why Tantra is so filled with images of monsters and Kali and, and uh, um, you know, terrifying metaphors and, you know, this kind of thing. And why, even to this day in India, Tantra is seen as uh, not entirely respectable. Uh, best left alone and best left only to the weirdos who live out in the forest. <laughs> um, that, uh, again, uh, curiosity being one of the fundamental building blocks of my personality or my whatever I am, um, the curiosity looks like it, it, it. there's a good chance it, it wins out every time over the horror and the fear and the trepidation of facing this. I often call boredom the monster. Um, why is boredom the monster? Because, we, because we've run out of distractions to take our minds off the endless chaotic <laughs> vortex of becoming. Um, we may be in a vortex. <laughs> we may be in this crazy kaleidoscope that's whizzing past us at all times. But we've constructed this thing called identity. We've constructed this thing called you know, non-contradiction to, to deal with it. Um, I would say that the tools that I use which I've borrowed from the Jains and the Buddhists, Anikantavada, Syadvada, and <laughs> Nayavada, you know, the wiki will tell you what you need to know about those, are provisional life rafts to sort of enable you to sort of deal with that. Deal with the fact that becoming is inevitable, regardless of what illusions you're clinging to. Um, the horror of existence is not necessarily a horror. You can't stop it the way that logic attempts to do. Logic attempts, if you ask me, to drive a fixed point into the ground and anchor becoming <laughs> and say, this is reality and it doesn't change or it doesn't change in any way that really uh, the fundamental nature of reality itself doesn't change. Well, I would say that Pantarai says otherwise. I would say probably that physics says otherwise as well. Um, so again, we can anchor ourselves, we can have all of our Zapfian illusions that we want, but it doesn't alter the fact that that's the way, apparently, things work. Um, again, this is, I'm simply referring to a thought experiment here, um, a way of trying to get your mind to perceive things. I'm not trying to say that this is the way that it is, it's just a... a something that I'm exploring, I guess, or that I have explored, or I've explored for most of my life. Um, that's the wonderful thing about, about um, provisional acceptance of logical axioms. You've got a moving fixed point, <laughs> a moving fixed point, a moving place to stand, a moving anchor. It's an anchor but it's not as solidly um, anchored, I guess. It's only provisionally anchored, and I can easily lift it up whenever I need to. If the chaos becomes too much, I can just drop it down a bit more, and if I'm comfortable enough, I raise it a bit more. Um, I'm in control of the situation. Um, Riding the tiger, that's, you know, the old tantric metaphor of riding the tiger. The tiger is a chaotic, crazy thing that does whatever it pleases and is beholden to nothing. It's, it, it is sufficient unto itself. Well, I'm jumping on the back of that tiger <laughs> um, and surfing on the 90-foot-high wave of becoming. Or, I'm not saying I'm doing that, but I'm positing a view that this might be something worth looking into. Um, otherwise, I think you're building illusions. You're building illusions that might look comforting, but I think something in us understands their illusions. 